Welcome to A Sound Constitution on 101.7 CHLY Radio. A health promotion show brought to you by VIU nursing students. Over the next hour, we will be demystifying health issues. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, listeners. Welcome to the fall edition of A Sound Constitution with your hosts, fourth-year nursing students, Jade, Julia, Sophia, Brittany, and of course, me, Allison. We are so excited to be back and fill your radio waves with fun and interesting health information for you to use to help to promote your health. After some great feedback from our last season of the show, we wanted to create a series of health promotion content in the form of a timeline. Everything from creating life to life as an older adult. Health promotion throughout the lifespan, as we call it. This way we can appeal to everyone out there in the community seeking new resources, wanting new and upcoming information, looking for some mist to dispel, and so much more great content. Today, we are going to start at the very beginning, even before birth. The series of events and preparation that lead to the main event, drum roll please, conception. I'll start off by giving you a few definitions to get a better understanding on what today's show is all about. So, what is preconception, and what can you do to optimize your health during this period of time? According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Conception health care is the medical care a, a woman or a man receives from the doctor or other health care professionals that focus on the parts of health that have been shown to increase the chances of having a healthy baby. Preconception health care is different for every person, depending on his or her unique needs. Based on a person's individual health, the doctor or other health care pro- professional will suggest a course of treatment or follow-up care as needed. If your health care provider has not talked with you about this type of care, ask about it. Preconception health is important for every woman, not just those planning pregnancy. It means taking control and choosing healthy habits. It means living well, being healthy, and feeling good about your life. Preconception health is about, taking a, it's about making a plan for the future and taking the steps to get there. Now, this is not just a one-sided event. A man is usually involved too and there are steps that he can do to increase the chances of a healthy pregnancy as well, as Jade will outline later in the show. This means choosing to get healthy and stay healthy as possible, and helping others to do the same as well. As a partner, it means encouraging and supporting the health of your partner. As a father, it means protecting your children. Preconception health is about providing yourself and your loved ones with a bright and healthy future. Now what about the little one? For babies, Preconception health means their parents took steps to get healthy before pregnancy. Such babies are much less likely to be born early, preterm, or have a low birth weight. They are more likely to be born without birth defects or disabling conditions. Preconceptional health gives babies the best gift of all, the best chance for a healthy start at life. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention also outlines 10 steps to starting the journey to a healthy baby. These include, number one, Make a plan and take action. Whether or not you've written them down, you probably have thought about your goals for having or or not having a baby. How to achieve these goals? For example, when you didn't want to have a baby, you used effective birth control methods to achieve your goals. Now that you're thinking about getting pregnant, it's really important to take the steps to achieve your goal, getting pregnant and having a healthy baby. Number two, see your doctor. Before getting pregnant, talk to your doctor about preconception health care. Your doctor will want to discuss your health history and any medical conditions you currently have that may affect your pregnancy. He or she will also discuss any previous pregnancy problems, medicines that you are currently taking, vaccinations that you might need, and steps that you can take before pregnancy to prevent any certain birth defects. Number three, take 400 micrograms of folic acid every day. Folic acid is a B vitamin. If a woman has enough folic acid in her body at least one month before and during pregnancy, it can help prevent major birth defects of the b- baby's brain and spine. Number four, stop drinking, smoking tobacco, or taking illicit street drugs. Smoking, drinking alcohol, and using street drugs may cause many problems during pregnancy for a woman and her baby, such as premature birth, birth defects, and infant death. If you're trying to get pregnant and cannot stop smoking, drinking, or using drugs, get help. Contact your local doctor or your treatment center. Number five, avoid toxic substances or environmental contaminants, harmful materials at work or at home, such as synthetic chemicals, 
metals, fertilizer, bug spray, and cat or rodent feces. These substances can hurt the reproductive systems of men and women. They can make it more difficult to get pregnant. Exposure to even small amounts of these during pregnancy, infancy, childhood, or puberty can lead to diseases. Learn how to protect yourself and your loved ones from toxic substances at work and at home. Number six, reach and maintain a healthy weight. People who are overweight or are obese have a higher risk of many serious conditions, including complications during pregnancy, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, certain cancers, including endometrial, breast, and colon. People who are underweight are also at risk for serious health problems. The key to achieving and maintaining healthy weight isn't about short-term dietary changes. It's about a lifestyle that includes healthy eating and regular physical activity. If you are underweight, overweight, or obese, talk to your doctor about ways to reach and maintain a healthy weight before you get pregnant. Number seven, get help for violence. Violence can lead to injury and death among women at any stage of life, including during pregnancy. The number of violent deaths experienced by women tells only part of the story. Many more survive violence and are left with lifelong physical and emotional scars. Number eight, collecting your family's health history can be important for your child's health. You might not realize that your sister's heart defect or your cousin's sickle cell disease could affect your child, but sharing this important family health information with your doctor can be important. Based on your family's history, your doctor might refer you to genetic counseling. Other reasons people go to genetic counseling include having several miscarriages, infant deaths, or having troubles getting pregnant, which is infertility. Number nine, get mentally healthy. Mental health is how we think, feel, and act as we cope in life. To be your best, you need to feel good about your life and value yourself. Everyone feels worried, anxious, sad, or stressed at sometimes. However, if these feelings do not go away and they interfere with your daily life, get help. Talk with your doctor or other healthcare professional about your feelings and treatment options. Number 10, have a healthy pregnancy. Once you get pregnant, be sure to keep up all of your new healthy habits and see your doctor regularly throughout your pregnancy for prenatal care. That's the beginning of our show, and I'm now going to pass it off to Julia, who had the opportunity to interview one of our BSN instructors, whose passion is perinatal health. Off to you, Julia. Okay, so I am here with Lynn Rollison. She is a nursing instructor at VIU um, and has a big range of experience um, in the labor and delivery department. So, hi, Lynn. Hi, how hi. are you doing? Good, thanks. How are you? Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to tell our listeners a bit about your career and where that's taken you? Well, uh, I've been an LPN and an RN, and I just recently um, received a PhD um, from uh, UBC Okanagan, and I looked at um, the impact that a difficult birth has on, on women and families. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, that's what I've been doing, and of course, teaching nursing students and working at the hospital up until about a year and a half ago oh, okay. so in the maternity unit. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so since our show reaches a wide variety of people across all walks of life, um, I wanted to start out by talking about why this information is relevant to all of our listeners. So do you want to talk about why pregnancy information is valuable to all members of the public? Mm -hmm. Well, um, pregnancy, we all came <laughs> into the being uh, from a pregnancy mm -hmm. and um, I think it behooves everybody to have some knowledge of, of how birth goes, support for families, because it does take a whole community to raise a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, so in your experience, what are some of the biggest fears pregnant women have about their pregnancy and labor experience? I think the number one and the most obvious fear that women experience is um, pain, the mm -hmm. fear of pain. Um, and and that's a reality. It really is. It's probably one of the most painful experiences that um, a woman will ever go through. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a very um, empowering and um, uh, life-changing event once one gives birth. I think women are, are changed. I've heard women say that they felt changed forever. They felt um, that they had uh, joined that um, all the women that had given birth before, they felt a oneness, that there's a certain spirituality about that. Mm -hmm. um, and our bodies are designed to give birth uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, 
and that pain, that opening of the cervix is um, is just part of it. And I think if w women think about to get through that pain, if they think about that's one contraction and mm -hmm. they never have to have it again. Yeah. And it's one step closer to the baby. And I think if you can look at it um, in, in that way, that it becomes easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a really good point. Other fears, I think, you know, how am I going to be as a mother? Mm -hmm. um, what's it going to be like? How am I going to fit work in? How am I going to do all of those things? I think those are also um, many, many thoughts, you know, for, for, for women as mm -hmm. well as, you know, um, as well as the pain. But I think pain is probably the biggest and how are they going to give birth? And, and I think that does impact sometimes how women uh, approach their birth that maybe they're um, they think that they can uh, ask for a cesarean birth and and we're certainly looking at that mm -hmm. uh, in practices in North America and there's some there's some concerns with that because our bodies are capable of, of doing that work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's very true Okay, so uh, I know in recent years there's been a lot more of a push to talk about nutrition for babies, specifically breastfeeding. Um, and do you want to talk a bit about why this is important to discuss early in pregnancy? Mm -hmm. Well, I think breastfeeding is um, a wonderful thing for babies and, and mothers as well and as the whole family. It certainly saves a great deal of money for the family and provides um, the perfect nutrition for that child. Um, that uh, there are issues with um, for women who are not able to breastfeed or feel that they can't breastfeed and I think there's sometimes a feeling that um, they're pushed to or they feel badly about those kinds of things and I think there's always alternates to to breastfeeding but if we are talking about breastfeeding um, I know that there are many many reasons that uh, the health of that child particularly a um, preterm infant uh, greatly benefit from from breastfeeding um, father support um, parental or family friend support I think is critical and um, I think from the research I have seen that often women are embarrassed to breastfeed in public and so they feel they're homebound and I think there needs to be a change in public opinion about mm -hmm. that that this is a normal healthy thing this is the best thing that you can do for a child mm -hmm. I think breastfeeding takes a great deal of preparation for the woman to think about how you're going to fit that in how is it going to feel um, getting supports from um, from public health from the perinatal unit when they're there if they're there or their midwife mm -hmm. Um, and also um, breastfeeding counselors and uh, lactation consultants can all help a woman successfully breastfeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, how can a partner be involved in a woman's pregnancy and delivery? Mm -hmm. This is a burgeoning area mm -hmm. of research is um, fathers before this um, really births, uh, fathers attending births really started in um, developed countries in about the 80s mm -hmm. and um, we've seen it's it's now an expectation that uh, fathers um, attend. Um, from the research I've done um, through my PhD several of the women said that they didn't feel that maybe their husbands were the best mm -hmm. and in looking at that issue um, maybe the, the birth was um, more traumatic than they thought or they they weren't prepared for that birth um, I've looked at some research around that and and um, that women have who have who do have support in labor they have a, a shorter labor they often have fewer problems um, involving interventions were more alert during the birth and uh, were more engaged with the neonate uh, with the baby they often say that um, there's less cesarean sections and less medications needed when a father is there. Hmm. Um, fathers being there, there's bonuses for that too. They are uh, more effective parents. They enjoy their babies more, but they also feel a bit helpless. And so uh, attending prenatal or doing their own preparation, uh, joining groups to learn about birth together, um, reading reliable sources and um, help to decrease anxiety 
for mm -hmm. the father and help him ready. We know that the more a dad is involved though, um, that there's surprise. What, I should go back, mm -hmm. what fathers uh, experience and what they aren't prepared for is the psychological distress of seeing their partner in pain mm -hmm. and not knowing what to do and I think that's the huge one huge issue mm -hmm. they're surprised also by the relationship changes not only with their partner but now they've got this new baby there mm -hmm. and um, love doesn't always come right away <laughs> but it certainly develops with that child and the more um, a partner helps out with that cha with the with the baby through changing that baby's diaper and holding that baby that those relationships develop and that is a surprise for a father mm -hmm. um, so on the other side that for the woman when they see their wife the woman that they love or their partner that they love in pain and agony and not knowing what to do it can um, uh, increase that sense of not knowing how to support her and not being prepared for that distress mm -hmm. that she's in. And yet we know that uh, I'm always surprised that when I see women in labor, she looks in a certain way with her anguish on her face. And then I see her the next day and I think, who is that lady with that, <laughs> that fellow I saw yesterday? She looks a different person. And mm -hmm. of course that distress, and of course she's a lovely young woman. And, uh, and of course, it's it's seeing that and being prepared for that. I think for those men, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, M more work needs to be done in that area for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so what are some of your suggestions to a first-time mother uh, to help her prepare for delivering her baby? Never mm -hmm. had a baby, mm -hmm. whole new experience for her. Well, I think there's, you know, lots of women before her have given birth, mm -hmm. and. Um, and I think it's really important that she, she finds some good supports, have a good circle of friends around her to support her women who've had babies, her mother, if, if that's a positive support for her. Mm -hmm. um, to go to prenatal classes, to there are pre-classes in uh, public health that um, touch base with the um, resources out in the communities for mothers. La Leche League is a great uh, institution. It's a worldwide group that supports mm -hmm. women breastfeed. I highly recommend that. There are birthing options um, such as um, uh, uh, water births and all kinds of things that you can look into. Mm -hmm. Hypnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's some great stuff out there. Um, I think also reading about um, people often share their bad stories, their awful stories about mm -hmm. birth and how do women put that into perspective. And I think exploring those sides and seeing what is that, what are those women talking about? Um, did they have a, an emergency uh, intervention or a cesarean birth? So to explore those areas to say, why would those occur? Why would that occur for me? Um, you know, is the baby breech? What does that mean? What are the outcomes of that? Mm -hmm. um, looking at postpartum depression, of course, is an issue that, that is in the media, um, but sometimes it's a bit suppressed. And, and um, I think looking at those topics and saying, gee, what is that? How do, we, how do we note what that is? How do we watch for that? How does the dad or the partner watch for that um, in the mother in, in the months to come after birth? Mm -hmm. I think being uh, connected um, with services is probably before you need them so that you know what's out there mm -hmm. and you know what to anticipate. Yeah. Because it's a life-changing event, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So you were talking about postpartum depression earlier. Do you have a few kind of um, things that people can look for or um, things that people can expect to experience versus what is abnormal mm -hmm. for a new mother? Well, you know, the rates of postpartum depression in in a first world country are certainly more so than we're seeing reported in developing countries mm -hmm. such as Thailand and other countries that, that research has been done. Um, we're looking at some statistics as high as 30 percent of women experiencing oh. postpartum depression. Um, there are screens and uh, doctors and midwives screen for that using usually the Edinburgh um, depression scale which is a short 10 
sort of question um, aspect of uh, asking women different aspects of their life. Mm -hmm. I think um, postpartum depression, um, my research certainly looked at that um, through women's difficult births and uh, women often suffered um, alone and covertly and it's very very difficult thing for women to talk about for some reason. Mm -hmm. Public health has some really great groups locally um, and uh, and nurses and public health are very aware of it but what to look for. So the first um, weeks after we have a baby we can often experience the blues mm -hmm. where we cry and and um, uh, weep and and uh, and that usually lasts maybe 10 days a couple of weeks and I've often wondered if that's not that overwhelming sense of uh, when you have this baby in your arms and and uh, and it's love at first sight you mm -hmm. see this baby you hear a mother say he she is the most beautiful child in the whole world and mm -hmm. you say of course that baby is mm -hmm. so they fall in love and then the overwhelmingness of responsibility and caring for that child, I wonder, and the hormones and all of those things that are changing back to the pre-pregnant state. Mm -hmm. But for postpartum depression, it can last up to from usually diagnosed at about four weeks to about a year after, and wow. it can stretch into that time. It can, um, it can look like mood disorders, um, fatigue, anxiety, fears, despair, compulsive thoughts. You can see those first few or, I mean, you've just had a baby, your body's gone through a lot. You might be uh, tired and fatigued, but it's when they start to go into those compulsive thoughts and loss of libido, mm -hmm. feelings of inadequacy, and then it can really uh, fulminate and grow, and that woman feels just dreadful. Mm -hmm. There's some really um, interesting thoughts that... Um, uh, Cheryl Titano Beck has done some great work and she talks about um, postpartum depression as being going to the gates of hell and back, mm. um, your worst possible nightmare and everything falling apart. So I think if women are feeling that desperate sense, really important to get some help. Mm -hmm. Speak to your doctor, speak to your care provider. Um, maybe, you know, antidepressants are the way to go and this is just transitory, this is not transitory, but this is just for a short time. You know, once you um, those feelings are resolved, it impacts not only the woman herself, but those around her, mm -hmm. her, her partner, uh, the child. Uh, prolonged, undiagnosed, untreated postpartum depression has effects on, on children, and there's certainly been research out there um, to, to look at that. So I would implore women to to identify that to a partner and usually it's the partner that's saying gee you're talking about some really odd things that they've never done before mm -hmm. you know these are unusual behaviors that women have um, are are experiencing there are some factors that um, play into postpartum depression such as a previous history of depression you might want to watch yourself for depression during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. If you've had um, postpartum depression in a previous pregnancy, you may experience that again in another. So to get their family ready, to pull in those resources, to um, uh, speak with your, your care providers, to, to alert them mm -hmm. so that you have those things in place so you can relax as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And if it happens, then, then it can be treated. Right. People living in poverty, low income, of course, and we have a great deal of that in Nanaimo. Mm -hmm. So that is of always of concern. And per, um, partner support is really, really important. Uh, and of course, if she's unhappy, he may well be unhappy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he or she may be unhappy as well. Mm -hmm. So really to be on top of that is, is, is the best thing. But not to feel... The, the awful thing is that women suffer alone. Mm -hmm. And having had postpartum depression with my first child and not really I knowing what it was until later, mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that's an awful thing to go through for for yourself to feel so low and bad that, um, that you're not alone out there. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. There are many women. Yeah. Yeah.
and you can help get help through public health and groups there. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of a big topic to only have a few minutes to talk about. But um, so kind of as we tie things up, what's you had a lot of experience, obviously. What's your area of passion that really gets you excited about nursing and all that? Well, I was just in preparing a little bit for mm -hmm. this uh, discussion with you, Julia. I was uh, looking at the um, at second part of my research that I'd really like to look at fathers and, mm -hmm. and um, of, of women who've had a difficult birth and how they manage through it. Because my work looked at women um, who experienced a, a traumatic birth and and how they their resilience through it and, and how they reshape their lives and I was thinking well gee what what about the fathers in that uh, or partners in the, in those experiences because that feeling of being stifled and and um, on the edges and on the fringes their their stories need to be told so mm -hmm. yes Lots of good areas to research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully it touched on some of the listeners' questions, but thank you so much for meeting with us, Lynn. Um, that's awesome. A lot of really great information. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Up next is an audio clip by Emily Grazley from the podcast The Brain Scoop on the history of childbirth. Enjoy. So you might remember Dr. Robert Martin, who you're familiar with from episodes like Breast Episode Ever and Why Did King Tut Have a Flat Head? He's a biological anthropologist and has spent his career researching various aspects of hominid evolution. A big part of his work focuses on the physical aspects of human reproduction and childbirth and how trends and practices in childbirth have changed throughout time. It got me thinking of that face that I made in the King Tut video. Before then, I'd never truly realized the logistical constraints of human childbirth. I mean, you've got to navigate this grapefruit-sized head and shoulders through an opening of roughly the same size and make a turn to get around the tailbone in the process. When you compare the pelvic size and shape to that of our closest great ape relatives, ours is disproportionately smaller and more obtuse. And that's because the act of walking permanently upright, known as bipedal locomotion, actually changed the shape of that pelvic opening. This, in addition to human babies having a longer gestation time, overall larger body size, and massive heads, leads to a lot of complications when it comes to human birthing practices. In fact, in a recent blog post, Dr. Martin wrote, astute analysis of a brain size and pelvic anatomy in our fossil predecessors have confirmed that births first began to become challenging when the genus Homo emerged around two million years ago. This means that women may have been relying on personal assistance in order to give birth for as long as two million years. So I started to wonder, how has our inability to give birth easily impacted mortality rates for both mother and child? Save the Children estimates that a million babies die the day they're born every year. So why does this happen and are things getting any better? Spoiler alert, these things are actually improving and I went to talk to Dr. Martin to get some answers. This is what a baby's head looks like at, at birth and, and that uh, head has to fit through the pelvis. So the baby goes in with its head facing sideways and then when it's halfway through the pelvis, it turns through 90 degrees to point backwards. It all boils down to a difficult passage through the pelvis because mm -hmm. of this trade-off between adaptation of the pelvis for upright walking and this big brain. So all of that points to the need for some kind of assistance. We don't know exactly when, but we can trace this process through the fossil record fairly effectively. And my guess is that uh, we started needing midwives about a million years ago. Oh There's some kind of help. You mentioned earlier that we have a, a great record for knowing how uh, how humans have evolved over time and how the evolution of birthing practices have evolved over time. So you can talk. Can you talk a little bit about some of the examples that we have uh, in the fossil record? So this here is uh, this is one side of the pelvis of, of Lucy. Uh, the famous uh, Australopithecus from Ethiopia. So if you mirror image the pelvis and put it together, you, know, you can work out how big the birth canal was. Right. And we can calculate how big the baby's head was likely to be. But then uh, when you get up to uh, Homo erectus, by 1.5 million years ago with early Homo, 
uh, we almost certainly had the beginnings of a difficult birth. They would have had slower births, and maybe they uh, already needed midwives at that stage. It's quite possible. I think midwives have been undervalued. I mean, there's been a medicalization of births and a drive towards having births in hospitals. It's much better for women, psychologically at least, to, to be working with a midwife than to go into the impersonal environment of a maternity. There was a study in Holland which showed that if you had a midwife in hospital compared to an obstetrician in that same hospital, birth took twice as long with the obstetrician than it did with the midwives. You know, I mean, it's pretty dramatic evidence to me. Something like 300,000 women die because of pregnancy-related issues, but most of those are preventable. I mean, sometimes you get blockage of the birth canal, but a lot of that just has to do with access to basic health care and uh, assistance in the process. It seems pretty logical to think that if you provide more access to health care and to nutrition uh, to decrease the number of children who are dying of malnutrition, then that would be beneficial all around. This is absolutely true. I mean, medical science has made huge leaps forward. But in industrialized countries, we've managed to get uh, birth-related mortality down. So that we're talking about a few per 100,000. So, I mean, these are really pretty low levels. Uh, but here's the thing, uh, if you just take industrialized countries where because of hospital services we've managed to reduce mortality, the lowest country on the list for industrialized countries is the United States. How come the richest country in the world has one of the highest levels of mortality around? And there was one drastic case which is the state of Texas. And in the state of Texas, the uh, maternal mortality was actually not rising very much until 2011. And then it doubled. Wow. It just shot up, and it's stayed at that level ever since. There's no health-related factor that can explain that. And the only explanation I've seen is that in 2011, a lot of uh, prenatal clinics were closed. And so I think there is a good possibility that a political decision in the state of Texas has actually doubled the rate of mortality in that state. Wow. So that's kind of a, a shocking example of how decreasing the access to health care facilities actually exponentially increases the rate of infant and mother mortality. Despite those kind of statistics, uh, things are improving globally for, for women and for infant care. I mean, especially if you're looking in the scale of the last hundred years or so, um, the percentage of children that are dying between age zero and five has decreased 40 percent in the last hundred years. From instances, it might look like things might be getting worse, but Overall, things are improving. Oh, absolutely, and I, I don't want to over-exaggerate things. I mean, the United States is last on the league list for industrialized countries, but it's still pretty low. Medical intervention and monitoring has got the death rate down considerably. It's quite a bit worse in developing countries, and the highest rates are in Africa. Africa has real problems with health provision, I think, and so we can see there the problems you get if you don't have regular monitoring. We have the benefit of technology and medical resources that hypothetically could be available to everybody alive today. 122 million children have been able to live thanks to access to health care and education. So that, to me, seems like a huge progress. What do you imagine for the future of humanity if everybody could have access to health care provided that, you know, you have some idea of what our evolutionary trajectory might be? Yes, the first thing I would say is that uh, a key to that improvement you've mentioned is prenatal care. That has already reduced the problems enormously and improved the prospects at birth. Unfortunately, a lot of people think the easy way out is to have cesarean births because then you don't have any problem of passing through the pelvis yeah. at all. That has got out of hand because WHO recognizes reckons that for medical reasons you might need to have a uh, caesarean every one in ten or one in uh, seven births, something like that. In the United States right now, one in three births is by caesarean, so uh, it's, wow. it's uh, increase uh, more than tripled in the, over the course of 40 years or so. You have full anesthesia for a, a cesarean. It's a major operation, and it has all kinds of side effects. But the example I, I've given in my 
my uh, writings is that in bulldogs, dogs with with really wide heads, we're talking about 85 to 95 percent cesareans. And if we don't watch it, we're going to end up like bulldogs. Wow. <laughs> Man, I just... I'm grateful for mothers everywhere. I think that's If you're just tuning in, you're listening to A Sound Constitution on 101.7 CHLY in Nanaimo. And that was an audio clip from Emily Graisley from the podcast The Brain Scoop. Up next, we have Jade talking about men's role and perspective in maternal health. Off to you, Jade. Hey everyone, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about men's health, role, and perspective in prenatal and natal health. And as the token male member of our group, it seemed rather fitting. I'm sure many of you are wondering what a man's role in all this might be. And to be honest, I was thinking much the same thing as I set out to tackle this. I figured, okay, yeah, maybe men have some thoughts and opinions as to what prenatal health means to them, but there can't be that much that applies directly to them health-wise, right? That's where I was very wrong. There is, in fact, a wealth of information out there about men's role in conception and birth. One really great resource that I found was the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. First off, making a plan of what your reproductive goals are is a good place to start. Whether or not you've written them down, you've probably thought about what your goals are for having or not having children and how you might achieve these. This, the CDC says, is called a reproductive life plan. As with anything in life, having a plan so you can take action is really important. Maybe you are adamantly against having children, in which case a reproductive plan might center around safe sex and methods of contraception that you will use. You may be young and unsure about whether or not you want to have children someday, in which case it's important to consider factors which may affect your current and future reproductive health. No matter who you are or what your plans are, having a reproductive plan that reflects your own personal values, goals, and resources is important. For more information and resources to make your own plan, you can check out the CDC website where they have a great tool for this. One crucial facet of reproductive health is the prevention and treatment of STIs. Some STIs can contribute to infertility. So getting tested and treating regularly for any STIs is important in protecting and maintaining reproductive health. It's also important to remember that although a woman is pregnant, she is still susceptible to STIs, which can pose significant harm to both her and her baby. So make sure you always practice safe sex. Also important to consider is how smoking, alcohol, and substance use may affect you, a pregnant mother, and her child. A pregnant woman who is exposed to secondhand smoke has a 20% higher chance of giving birth to a baby with low birth weight than women who are not exposed to secondhand smoke during pregnancy. Secondhand smoke can also cause disease and death in both children and adults who don't smoke. Additionally, excessive alcohol consumption and substance use can impact a man's fertility. If you cannot stop smoking, drinking, or using substances, then get help. You can talk to your doctor Or here in Nanaimo, we have a great resource at Brooks Landing, where there is walking counseling to help with substance use and addiction. Another important factor which can seriously affect the reproduction of healthy sperm are toxic substances and workplace environments. Everything from lead, excessive heat, and even military radar can have an influence on sperm production. For a full list of what affect the health of your sperm, go check out the CDC website. These conditions may cause a decrease in the number of sperm which your body produces or damage and alter the ones you do produce. If a damaged sperm does fertilize an egg, the egg might not develop properly, causing a miscarriage or possible health problem for the baby. If a reproductive hazard is carried in the sperm, the fetus might be exposed within the uterus, possibly leading to problems with the pregnancy or with the health of the baby after it is born. So how can workers be protected from reproductive health hazards? Store chemicals in sealed containers when they are not in use. Wash hands before eating, drinking, or smoking. Avoid skin contact with chemicals. If chemicals do contact the skin, follow directions for washing provided in the material safety data sheet. Employers are required to provide an MSDS for all hazardous material used in the workplace. Become familiar with the potential reproductive hazards 
used in your workplace. It's also important to try and protect your home from possible contamination. To do so, remember to change out of contaminated clothing and wash with soap and water before going home. Store street clothes in a separate area of your workplace to prevent contamination. Wash work clothing separately from other laundry, if possible, and avoid bringing contaminated clothing and other objects home. In addition to what we've already discussed, there are also some other factors which can cause infertility in men. These include diseases such as mumps, serious conditions like kidney disease or type 1 diabetes, or hormone problems. Medicines, prescription and non-prescription, and herbal products, and radiation treatment or chemotherapy for cancer. Age and obesity may also influence a man's fertility. If you're concerned about your fertility, talk with your doctor or another health professional. Something else to consider if you're planning to have a child is to consider your family's health history. We now know that there is a significant genetic component to many health conditions. You might not realize your sister's heart defect or your cousin's sickle cell disease could affect your child, but sharing this family history information with your doctor can be important. Based on your family history, your doctor might refer you to genetic counseling. Other reasons people go for genetic counseling include having several miscarriages, infant deaths, or trouble getting pregnant, or genetic condition or birth defect that occurred during a previous pregnancy. If you're thinking about starting a family, considering your mental health is also an important step. Mental health is how we think, feel, and act as we cope in life. To be your best, you need to feel good about how your life and how you value yourself. Everyone feels worried, anxious, sad, or stressed sometimes. However, if these things do not go away and they're interfering with your daily life, get help. Lastly, as partners, men can encourage and support the health of women. For example, if your partner is trying to eat healthier or get ready for pregnancy, you can join her and eat healthier too. Or if your partner has a medical condition, you can encourage her to see her doctor and remind her to follow her treatment plan. Up next, we have Sophia talking about nutrition in pregnancy. Now we have a little segment around healthy eating during pregnancy for you and your baby. Healthy eating plays a very important role in a healthy pregnancy. You need to eat foods from a variety of sources to make sure you get all the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that you and your developing baby need. Eating well will also help you feel better, give you more energy, and help you gain a healthy amount of weight. It will also contrib contribute to your baby's healthy growth and development. The following information comes from the Government of Canada's health guidelines. Let's dive into it. During your second and third trimesters of pregnancy, you will need a few more calories each day to support the growth of your baby. One extra snack is often enough. For example, have an apple or a pear with a small piece of cheese as an afternoon snack. Follow Eating Well with Canada's Food Guide to eat the amount and the type of food that is right for you and your baby. Fruits and vegetables are a must. Pregnant women need fruits and vegetables every day. Brightly colored vegetables and fruit contain more of the kinds of vitamins you and your baby need. You should eat at least one dark green and one orange vegetable every day. Make sure your fruits and vegetables are prepared with little or no added fat, sugar, or salt, and choose vegetables and fruit more often than juice. Grain products are important. You need to include grain products as part of your daily diet. This includes foods like bread, rice, and pasta. Try to choose grain products that are lower in fat, sugar, and salt, and look for the whole grain variety, since at least half of your daily grain intake should be whole grain. Have milk and milk alternatives for strong bones. Milk and al alternatives are important for your growing baby. Opt for the low-fat variety, which will give you a high quality of protein, calcium, and vitamin D that you need, but with less of the fat and less of the calories. Have skim, 1% or 2% milk every day and go for lower fat varieties of yogurt and cheese. Drink fortified soy beverages if you do not drink milk. Include meat and meat alternatives. Eating meat and alternatives each day will help you and your baby stay healthy. Choose lean or less fatty meats and meats alternatives, such as dried peas, beans, tofu, or lentils, and choose those made with little or no added fat or salt. Fish is also important and should be eaten each week, but choosing which fish to eat and how much can be complicated. Visit Health Canada's website to find out how to choose the fish that are low in mer mercury 
so that you and your baby can take advantage of the benefits of eating fish while mis minimizing the risks. To supplement all this, all women who become pregnant and those who are pregnant should take a multivitamin containing 0.4 milligrams of folic acid every day. What is folic acid? Folic acid is the form of folate found in vitamin supplements and fortified foods. Fortified foods, also called enriched foods, are foods that have specific nutrients added to them. Folate is needed for a healthy pregnancy. It can be in the form of folate or folic acid. Research has shown that the body uses folate during your pregnancy to make blood cells and help your baby grow. Folic acid also lowers the risk of your unborn baby having a neural tube defect, also called NTD. NTDs are a group of serious birth defects that affect a baby's spinal cord, brain, and skull. Some babies with severe NTDs are stillborn or do not survive long after birth. Spina bifida is one of the most common NTDs. NTDs happen when the tissue in the bone around the brain and spine do not grow very well. It can happen in the third and fourth week after conception, which is the first or second week after you first missed your period. Meaning, this could happen before you even know that you're pregnant. So, if you are not pregnant yet, but planning on it soon, it is still a good idea to start increasing the folic acid intake to ensure healthy development of your baby's brain and spine. Now we're going to address some common questions around prenatal nutrition. Question one, how much weight should I gain while I'm pregnant? Well, this is based on your body mass index, your BMI, which is a number based on a comparison of your weight to your height. So simply put, it depends on your weight before your pregnancy. If your BMI is below 18.5, the, re the recommended weight gain is between 28 to 40 pounds. A BMI between 18.5 to 24.9 warrants a weight gain of 25 to 35 pounds. A BMI between 25 to 29.9 means you should gain around 15 to 25 pounds. And a BMI greater than 30 means getting around 11 to 20 pounds. Question two, is there anything I shouldn't eat while I'm pregnant? Yes, avoid the food, the following foods, which may, may be contaminated by bacteria. Raw fish, especially shellfish, such as oysters and clams. Undercooked meat, poultry or seafood. Hot dogs, non-dried deli meats, meat spreads, and refrigerated smoked seafood and fish. All foods made with raw or lightly cooked eggs. Unpasteurized and pasteurized soft cheeses. Raw sprouts, especially alfalfa sprouts. Question three, I often have to eat on the run. What should I grab as a snack? There are lots of healthy foods that you can eat on the run. Try pre-washed vegetables like baby carrots, cauliflower, or broccoli. Raisin boxes are another good option. Low-fat cottage cheese, low-fat yo yogurt, mixed vegetable juice or fruit juice, trail mix or cheese. And don't forget, drink plenty of water. Now it's time for the part of the show where we bust some myths and address some common misconceptions. Could everything you know about pregnancy be wrong? Let's get the facts straight. The following information is brought to you by the Women's Health Expert Advisory Board. So Jade, pregnancy lasts exactly nine months, right? Well, actually, in reality, the length of your pregnancy can vary by as much as five weeks. According to a 2013 study published in the Journal of Human Reproduction, when you deliver ultimately depends on your age, your weight, and how much you weighed at birth, and a slew of other factors. Hey, Sophia, sex while you're pregnant can hurt the baby, right? Actually, in almost all cases, sex shouldn't affect your little one says Sherry Brassner, Assistant Clinical Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Science at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. There are some exceptions, though. If your placenta is positioned abnormally, or if you're at a high risk for a preterm birth, consult your doctor. Is it true that you can't have a natural birth after you've had a C-section? Well, evidence suggests that having a vaginal birth after cesarean is slightly riskier than a repeat C-section. A vaginal birth is a reasonable option for many women, says Brasner. Just discuss the pros and cons with your doctor before you hit the delivery room. Hey, Sophia, 
The baby's sex affects the positioning of your baby bump, right? Actually, the baby's sex has absolutely nothing to do with the way the woman appears, says Brasner. So sorry, but you can't tell the baby's gender just by looking at mom. Gosh darn it! <laughs> so Jade, if you have an STI, your baby will too, right? Actually, it depends on the STI you have, says Brasner. That's because some STIs infect the blood and can pass through the placenta, while others only pose a threat by direct contact. The second type can be passed along during a vaginal delivery, so your doctor might recommend a C-section to prevent infection. You can't run while you're pregnant, right? A lot of what women can do during pregnancy depends on what she was able to do before pregnancy, says Brasner. And no, you don't have to worry about the baby tumbling out while you're on the treadmill. You can keep doing what you're doing, or you could try a cardio workout plan specifically designed for your first, second, or third trimester. But you lose your baby weight during delivery, uh uh-huh. Buzzkill alert! Women only lose between 10 to 15 pounds, including the baby and some water weight when they give birth, although most women gain between 25 to 35 pounds throughout the pregnancy. It can take a year or more to lose the rest. But on the bright side, breastfeeding can speed things along. When you're pregnant, you have to eat for two, right? Actually, the growing baby inside of you doesn't burn as many calories as you might think. If you already eat a well-balanced diet, adding a snack or two a day, mm, about 300 extra calories is really all that you need. Oh, wow. I have a question for you. Every woman can breastfeed if she wants to, right? Well, certain breast surgeries can make breastfeeding difficult, and some medications can make breastfeeding ill-advised, says Brasner. Learn why breastfeeding is best and how to get support if you're struggling with to breastfeed. Certain foods and sex can bring on labor, can't they? Well, getting busy and doubling up on hot sauce won't hurt the baby. There's very limited evidence indicating that any activity or food can reliably stimulate labor, says Brasner. We hope that this session has helped clear some muddy waters around the reality of pregnancy. You're listening to 101.7 CHLY Radio, and we've been talking about all things prenatal. The first fetal movements that can be felt during pregnancy are called the quickening. In a wonderful coincidence, we've got a song with the same name. Here's local musician, the lovely Tina Jones, with The Quickening.
That was local artist Tina Jones with The Quickening. You can find Tina's music on Bandcamp. Thanks for listening to A Sound Constitution on 101.7 CHLY Radio. For more information, questions, or comments, please visit our Facebook page at A Sound Constitution. Tune in again next Thursday morning from 10 to 11. Stay healthy, Vancouver Island.